Today on the Joel Klatt Show, we break down all of the action from the CFP semifinals, a classic Rose Bowl, and an epic Sugar Bowl. That was a great day of college football. College football has never been better. Interest has never been higher. I believe that we are at the dawn of the golden age of college football. It was an epic day of college football. It was just one of those days where you fall in love with the sport all over again. Man, what an incredible college football playoff. The semifinals were... I'll tell you what, that was sensational. That was sensational. I'll break it all down here in just a moment. But first, uh, got to remind you to go follow the pod uh, wherever you get your podcast. Go ahead and subscribe, like and review our, our show if you could. Go ahead and subscribe on the YouTube channel. You can like and review us there. You can leave a comment on the show, but make sure you subscribe so you get all of our content right when we drop it out. And then on social media, wherever you like to social media, wherever you, if you're, you know, one of these young cats on TikTok or, you know, you're not a young cat, and you may or may not be on Facebook. We're in, in both places. So you've got it right there at Joel Klatt Show on social media. All of our content is out there. Um, the Rose Bowl holds a, a near and dear spot to my heart, not just because I love this hat, but I mean, that's part of the reason. But like this, this hat is obviously great. If you're watching the show on YouTube, uh, you'll see that I'm wearing the hat right now, but also because um, it is the only game of the year, college football game of the year, that I get to actually just take my kids to and and go to the game as dad. And and Sarah and I get to go and, and take our boys and enjoy this sport that I love so much. If you've listened to this program for any length of time, you'll know that I fell in love with college football back in 1986. Um my dad took me to the University of Colorado. We sat in the free tickets that he got because he was a high school football coach. They were playing the University of Oklahoma with um, uh, Bosworth was on that team. And that was a really good OU team. I saw the Buffalo run out. And so for me, that's when I fell in love with the sport. I knew I always wanted to be involved in it. I wanted to play it all. Of it. And so in a lot of ways, I'm carrying out that dream. The only downside of working in college football in this space, of making my life's passion now my career, is that I actually don't get to take my kids to a lot of games. Well, that always changes every single New Year's Day when I get to take my kids to the Rose Bowl. Um, if you're on Twitter or Instagram, you can go follow me out there. You can follow me on Twitter at Joel Clatt or on Instagram at Joel underscore Clatt. And you'll see a picture of me and my family out there at the Rose Bowl. So I was there uh, live. Uh, and don't worry, I did wear the hat. But Sarah and I took our boys, Henry, Sam, and Theodore, and we took them to the Rose Bowl, and it was an incredible game. And they're getting to that age now where they're into it, whether they're rooting for the teams or not. You know, they end up kind of choosing a team, in particular, like based on who we're sitting around, and then they're high fiving people. It was a great day. Um, I firmly believe that that is the greatest setting in college football, and in a lot of ways, in American football. I know that the Super Bowl is incredible and it's iconic, and, and that's certainly the case. But when it comes to college football, the Rose Bowl is, there's something special about the Rose Bowl, and it's a real marquee event. This is why I think that the new playoff, how they create the playoff in 2026, should really sit around, the centerpiece should be the Rose Bowl game. Because in a lot of ways, you can't just recreate and rebrand something as iconic as the Rose Bowl game and that that destination. And so I think that we should build around it. I get to take my kids there. It was awesome. And then we got to see an unbelievable game to boot. <laughs> it was such a good game. So Michigan and Alabama play an absolute thriller in the Rose Bowl. I mean, all of us hoped that these games would be really good. And when the playoff came down, a lot of us were saying, myself included, that we thought that these matchups really could be epic matchups. And that this was part of the reason of why the four teams that they included were included is because these were going to be the best matchups and these were going to be, these were the best teams and are the best teams in, in the country. And so here's the, the Michigan team comes in undefeated. Alabama comes in after beating Georgia, ending a 29 game winning streak to the back-to-back -back national champions. And they played an unreal football game. Now, was it sloppy at times? Yes. Was it the perfect game? No. 
But man, that was entertaining. You know, for anybody that loves the sport, that was an incredible watch. Now, being there was obviously, you know, I mean, I, I guess I I don't want to rub it in, but like it, it was it was phenomenal. That setting with the sun setting, you know, behind the San Gabriels and 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 the flyover and the colors and and oh, it's it was incredible. And Michigan ends up winning the game. Michigan beats Alabama. Now they they roll into that game favored, and yet I know they're going to play kind of the disrespect card and the nobody believed in us card. Heck, they could probably say that about me. I mean, officially, I picked Alabama in the game, but Michigan wins wins the game and ends up really doing to Alabama what they've done to a lot of teams this year, which has kind of squeezed the life out of them in a lot of respects. And, and I'm going to get to all of that in, in just a moment. But let me start by, by saying that in order to beat Alabama, and maybe this is a different version of Alabama than we've seen over the last few years. And, and you know what? Fair enough. However, to beat any Alabama team under Nick Saban, it usually takes, now maybe not all the time, but but usually takes a pretty clean game by, by your team and really good quarterback play. And if you get those two things, it's like, okay, then, then if you can match up and if you're talented enough and if you're physical enough, then you can maybe create some spots where you can get some wins and actually go win the football game. But it's tough. It's, it's incredibly tough. And we've seen that time and time again. Even when Georgia has beaten them, like it's tough to do. And so when when I'm prepping for this game and I'm and I'm seeing what Michigan has done against Iowa and what what Alabama has done against Georgia, I I didn't see this coming. And in particular the way that it played out. And and that's because like Michigan didn't play a clean game at all. At all. They got thoroughly beaten in the special teams. They gave Alabama a couple of short fields that ended up being touchdown scores on those ensuing drives. Normally, when that happens, the tide doesn't lose. They just don't. They just don't. They capitalize on opponents' mistakes about as well as anybody and because they generally play a clean game. But they also made a lot of mistakes. Now, maybe they weren't as as egregious as some of the Michigan mistakes, but man, some of the negative plays on offense, whether it be the inability to protect the passer or or the weird snaps that were an issue for Jalen Milrow the entire game, like it it was clear that that Alabama was going to have a hard time driving the length of the field and scoring a touchdown on what has largely been the best defense in college football. So Michigan does not play clean. And and think of some of the issues that they had on special teams. They had the muff punt that led to an Alabama touchdown. They had the box, botched extra point, which loomed large, and the only reason we went to overtime. They had the missed field goal. They had you know, another near disaster on the, on the fumbled punt. You know, the, another muffed punt. Right before they ended up just taking a knee, they call timeout just to get another chance, just some chance at the end of the game, end up muffing that punt, and all of a sudden they're you know inside their own one-yard line. Meanwhile, Bama's special teams were tremendous. Riker, two field goals from 50-plus. Their punt team was incredible. In, in fact, five punts down to inside the 20-yard line, including a 49-net average. So it's like, do I normally come on this podcast and talk a lot about special teams? No, I, I don't. But what you have to realize is like Alabama thoroughly beat Michigan at what has tended to be and certainly was for the entirety of this year a real strength for Michigan, which was the special teams. And if you would have told me that before the game, I would have said, nope, Michigan's not overcoming that and winning the game. The other part of teams that end up beating Alabama under Nick Saban is that their quarterback plays really well. And up until the last series, I wouldn't have said that that was the case with J.J. McCarthy. There was a lot of missed throws, in particular the first snap of the game. That was weird, where he basically throws an interception, ends up being out of bounds, so that it's not an interception. That was a, a, a start that he wants to forget. He settled down a little bit, still wasn't clean and great during the course of the game, but showed up late and more on that in a little bit. So what ends up happening then? So like, how do you win? How do you overcome those miscues? How do you overcome the fact that the quarterback wasn't tremendous through the majority of the game or that the special teams was a real 
hindrance, not even weak, but like a hindrance during the course of the game. Here's how. Defensive line play. Defensive line play. College football this time of year is always about defensive line play. And it rings true again today. Think about this. Michigan's defensive line had 10 tackles for loss and six sacks. Thoroughly dominated Alabama. Not even close. Okay, I know I didn't watch the broadcast, but I was there, and the line of scrimmage was not even close. The Michigan defense took it to Alabama at the line of scrimmage. Now, Alabama created some things, namely with quarterback run with Jalen Milrow, which we talked about being an issue for, for the Michigan defense. But that was never going to be sustainable long term because they couldn't throw it because they couldn't protect. Not even close. They couldn't handle the blitzing and, and the structure of blitzing that Jesse Minter, the defensive coordinator from Michigan, was bringing. They couldn't handle the stunts from the defensive line. They couldn't handle the overall rush. And again, there might not be a singular great pass rusher for Michigan, but as a collective, they're as good of a pass rush as there is in college football. Um, that Michigan defense held out of Alabama to a season low of 288 total yards. Meanwhile, on the other side, Michigan's offensive line did a really good job against the Tide up front. Alabama only had one tackle for loss and one sack. So when you're talking about disruptive plays, drive-killing plays, Michigan was gaining them, Alabama wasn't on the defensive side. And that's a kudos to that defensive line. And think about it. It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to just sit back and think of, oh, okay, so like who's actually won the national championship the last few years? Who's actually been a great team the last few years? Well, the teams with the best defensive lines. It rings true every season. And in this season, the best defensive line in the country happens to be Michigan. They're the deepest, and they're the best. They're the most physical. You don't generally run the football on them. Again, Alabama ran for 172 yards. That's what the stat sheet will say. But it was basically Milrow, and it was basically quarterback design runs or scrambles. And there were a couple of those in there as well. M Milrow he was really going to be the only offense for them. They got a little running game going, but they weren't throwing it. There was no separation in the secondary. The secondary for Michigan just totally locked up Alabama. They had no ability to create separation. So the defense and the defensive line in particular, they negated all the other things that were happening. And normally, normally, you don't beat Alabama unless you play clean and you got great quarterback play. But normally, you don't dominate Alabama at the line of scrimmage like Michigan did today. And I know you're probably listening to this on the day after, so I'm recording this. I keep saying today, but that's what it was for me today. That defensive line was incredible, and they are the best in, in the country. So what happens is like now, because of all the mistakes going back and forth, it becomes a great battle. And in the third quarter, it really looks like Bama's going to come back and win that football game. And they, they grab the lead, and they're starting to win the line of scrimmage now. And, and you get this sense like maybe the clock has struck midnight on the Michigan Wolverines. Maybe it's just not going to happen for them. And lo and behold, their defensive line started playing better. And then they finally now, in the course of now you're talking about the history of, of Harbaugh at Michigan, had a player that can walk on the field inside of five minutes down in the fourth quarter and drive the team the length of the field to win. I've covered Michigan uh, for quite a while now. And in fact, I did Jim Harbaugh's first game. Uh, and it was a game at Utah. And there's been a lot of constants for Michigan football outside of the COVID year in which they struggled. But they're going to be physical. They're going to be tough. They, they play, generally speaking, cleaner in particular on the special teams than they did in, in the Rose Bowl. But it's like, it's kind of the same team. They're going to do things the right way. They're going to, it's going to be tough to score on them. They're going to play quality defense. They're going to be physical. Like, and then they've morphed and they've adjust, uh, adjusted schematically in particular on defense. And they've done some really good things over the years. But there's always been that element of like, well, but what happens if you get into a game where it's like, you have to have it and you're down in the second half? 
And it's like, well, they, ha- they don't have that element. So if they can squeeze you to death early and if they can just run the football and, and if they can just play Michigan ball, then they're going to be fine. But guess what? They weren't in that situation in the Rose Bowl. So now it goes back to that giddy feeling that Michigan fin- uh, fans had when J.J. McCarthy signed with Michigan as a high school recruit. Because it's like, oh, man, we're getting a five-star quarterback. Maybe we could have the guy that walks onto the field that can create a score when we need it. And lo and behold, what happens? Under five minutes, J.J. walks on the field. They haven't done much at all in the second half offensively, and yet they're able to drive the length of the field, make great plays, and score a touchdown to tie the game. That's the difference. That's the difference. Okay, they they didn't have that even two years ago. You know, I'll do respect to Cade McNamara. Um, they didn't have the team on the defensive line like they do this year, last year. And, and that's why, like, they couldn't squeeze the life out of TCU. And now you're putting it all together where you've got the boa constrictor, and yet you still have the ability with a quarterback to go out there and win the game. And give a ton of credit to the guys making the plays on the outside. Blake Corum had a great game. The offensive line did a great job, for the most part, all day of opening up lanes, in particular on the edge, when they were running outside, some of the creative outside runs. They gave McCarthy some time. I thought Sharon Moore did some creative things. And then they got to the crossing routes late in the game. So the best thing in the passing game that they did the entirety of the game, and again, I didn't watch it uh, of the broadcast. I watched just up up from the stands. And I could tell like th- they were running a version of the like bracket man style defense that Saban really loves. That's why some of those crossing routes were open. And some of them were zone, some of them were man. But like generally speaking, the, the crossing routes were open, whether it was deep overs or shallow crosses or even those drag routes, the slide routes from the backfield, whether it was running backs or, or the, the, the wide receivers. And those were open for the majority of the game. And that's exactly where Sharon Moore went to. And this is what I love about a young player co- play caller that has creativity but didn't get too cute in the big moments. He went directly to what was working that day, which was those crossing routes. And he's able to, even in the biggest call of the game on fourth down, he gets that little slide route to Roman or to, to Blake Corum. He gets a big deep over route to Roman Wilson on a, on a catch that I thought was tremendous. Lo and behold, I, it looked kind of awkward and like a great catch from the stands. I didn't realize it was tipped, and, and it was. But he goes, sure on more, the play caller, to the things that were working for the majority of the day, and they drive the length of the field, and J.J. makes the plays and they're able to get into the end zone. And now, in my mind, I'm like, well, Jim's going to go for it. They're going to go for it. I'm kind of getting like caught up in the moment. And then after the fact, he kicks the extra point, and I'm like, well, of course. He's got the better team. The better team was Michigan. And in a lot of ways, you negate the ability of Alabama's special teams to impact the game in the punt game because there are no punts in overtime. And that was the weakest part that Michigan had and the strongest part that Alabama had. And and yeah, I get it. You might have to kick a field goal here, here or there in, in overtime. But extending the game, all it does is allows Jim Harbaugh to put what he feels like at that moment, and he's not wrong, which is putting the better team on the field for more snaps. That defensive line was going to continue to win, and then they win. It was abundantly clear in the stadium that Jalen Milrow was going to get the ball on fourth down. I know that there's a lot of call, the, the talk about the play call and this or that. Could they have called something different? Sure. I mean, you can always call something different. If it doesn't work, it's a bad call. If it works, you're the smartest coach, and you're going to get a raise. That's just the way that it the way that it goes. I will just tell you, it was abundantly clear that they couldn't throw the ball, even on the the, the plays that they were trying to get outside of the pocket. Everyone's like, get them outside of the pocket. Those didn't work all day long. The entire second half, they were trying to slide him out of the pocket. There was nowhere to throw the football. So Bama, in that respect, went to the things that did have success. So what did they call on fourth down? Exactly what had gotten them in that position in the first place, which was quarterback run. And they didn't get it. And Michigan was ready for it. 
I think the the last big piece of credit needs to go to Rod Moore, uh, the safety for Michigan, because he he made that tackle on Jalen Milrow on the 15 yard run in overtime. It looked from my vantage point like it was going to break open for a touchdown. Rod Moore gets him down to the ground, lives to snap it another day, and they ended up getting the stop. And so now Michigan is going to go play for the national championship. Jim Harbaugh is going to play for the national championship, and Bama is going to lose. Saban had one of his last six semifinal games that he was in, but not this time. And that was a classic, folks. That was a classic. And I guess all said and done, Michigan was the team in the Rose Bowl that they were for the majority of the season. And Alabama was in the Rose Bowl the team that they were for the majority of the regular season. And in that respect, the better team won the Rose Bowl. For one week, Bama beating Georgia, Michigan not playing great against Iowa, it looked like it it was going to flip. And because those were the last games that we saw, I mean it spooked a little it spooked me. Obviously, that's why that's why I picked Alabama. That's why I picked Alabama, but Michigan wins the game. Uh, and big credit to them. I thought that they did a great job. Jesse Minner has got to be off, awfully proud, defensive coordinator. And Michigan will go to Houston and play for the national championship. And who will they play? The Washington Huskies. How about that Sugar Bowl? I mean, I know that it doesn't quite feel like the overtime thriller, but that got really good late. More on that in just, just a moment. Well, no, that's where I'll start because... The game's basically over. Washington's trying to run out the clock, and I feel terrible for Dylan Johnson. He gets rolled up. I'm hoping, I haven't heard or seen, I guess I should say, an update on his injury. I'm hoping Dylan Johnson is not hurt as badly as what it looked like uh, because it, it looked like that could be something that's going to keep him out of next Monday's game. Let's hope that's not the case. Again, I haven't heard anything officially, but because he goes down late in that game, Washington had to take a timeout. So they were going to just give the ball back to, to, to Texas, who had to score a touchdown on their next possession to win the game. And they were going to have, what, like 15 seconds left or, or less than that. But because of the injury and the timeout, then all of a sudden they've got to give the ball to them with, what, 45 seconds left? Then they get the penalty and the long pass. And it's like, oh, my goodness, is Texas actually going to win this game? And then you get to the last sequence, and Texas falls apart completely. Quinn Ewers fell apart completely on the last few few plays. One, you cannot throw a swing route on first down with 15 seconds left. Like, I don't know what that was. Second down, he basically threw it out of the back of the end zone. Third down, you get pressure, and I guess that's a smart play. He gets it off and lives to fight another down. And then on fourth down, he basically throws it out of the end zone again. Let me, word of the wise, quarterbacks, 100% of the passes that you throw out of bounds are going to be incomplete. I know that's shocking. I know that's shocking. 60% of the time, it works every time. Um, but now we get to the more important part of the game. And the more important part of the game is the fact that Michael Penix is that dude at quarterback. That guy is really good. I'm happy for him that he went out there and played the way that he has for the majority of the last two seasons. And in a lot of ways was his introduction to some people around the country, because it's abundantly clear to me that there are a lot of people that didn't watch this guy play. When I see the reaction online of, of Penix going 29 to 38 for 430 yards and, and a couple of TDs, and, and, and you see the throws that he makes, we've broken it down on this show. If you're listening to this show, you've heard me talk about this guy and how well he passes the football. Not throws the football, passes the football with great leverage, timing, his ability to manipulate the pocket. All of it. It's so good. It's so good. His game translates to the next level. 
He has been as good of a quarterback in college football as there has been over the last two years. And yet, it was heresy to even suggest that Michael Penix could in any way be in the conversation for the Heisman Trophy. Don't you realize that those people, and you know exactly who you are, that said that it was not a conversation between Jaden Daniels and Michael Penix are the same people that didn't watch Michael Penix play because he's been doing this forever. He did it all year, and he did it for a team that was desperate to have him play that way because they played so many tight football games. Abundantly clear. Watching people being like, oh, man, Penix, I guess, should have been considered for the Heisman. You think? He wasn't padding stats against Grambling and Georgia State. Listen, all due respect to Jaden Daniels, who was a phenomenal player this year. Phenomenal. But the notion that it was not a conversation between Penix and Daniels is ridiculous. And it shows obscene bias by those that would suggest as such. Because what we saw against Texas was a clinic. What we saw in the Sugar Bowl was a clinic from Michael Penix. This guy can play, man. He can flat out spin the rock. He throws with great leverage. When I say leverage, by the way, let me explain what I mean about like great leverage. And I'm not just saying accuracy because the two are different. <clears throat> so in order to pass the football, and again, I don't say throw, I say pass because he's a great passer. He's passing the football to his teammates. And when you pass someone the ball, you pass them the ball with collect, uh, correct leverage. And that leverage meaning always where it's advantageous for your player as opposed to the defense. It's not a 50-50 ball. It's a 70-30 ball. It's an 80-20 ball. It's a 90-10 ball. Okay? You're missing always to your player's side moving him away from defenders. That's passing with leverage. Now, does it take extreme accuracy? Yes. So is he an accurate passer? Well, of course, there's, there's no doubt. But it's even better than that because he's always putting his players in position to succeed. He's giving them better odds than other quarterbacks give their wide receivers. So basically, his wide receivers, who are excellent, by the way, excellent players, as good as there are in college football, their, their wide receiver room rivals any in the country, including Ohio State. Those two, I think, are the best wide receiver rooms in the country. And, and he takes that excellent core of wide receivers and allows them to basically sit at a blackjack table and play with the ability of counted cards, basically with the odds in their favor. Always, because he passes the ball with great leverage. His downfield accuracy is exquisite. His ability to avoid the rush, fantastic. He's more mobile than, than you would think. Now, he's granted had a couple of those knee injuries, and so he doesn't run quite as much as what he, uh, as what he used to when he was um, at Indiana in particular. But he can do it, and he did it against Texas a few times on quarterback design runs. And, like, again, this is that whole game. I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, okay, you know. And these – I mean, these guys in our business, they're in our business, which is, which is wild. And even to bring up the notion that it was a, a conversation, a debate – between Jaden Daniels and Michael Penix, to them was just like obscene. It was crazy. And it's like, okay, well, you haven't watched, obviously. And, and you saw some of that surprise from folks on Sugar Bowl night, if you want to call it that. Monday night. Just call it Monday night. Um, the other thing that, that I thought Washington was the beneficiary of is that I thought Texas was too aggressive now, again, this is a double-edged sword because if you're aggressive and it works, then it's fantastic. And if you're aggressive and it doesn't work, then guess what? It's second and 10. And, and it's, it's essentially like creating a negative play. And so because of that, Texas was constantly 
chasing what I would call efficiency. They were chasing the ability to, to be on the schedule. Their first six third downs of the game were all third and 10 or longer, partly because they kept trying to take, like, get creative, take shots, do little things here and there, which, you know, at times didn't work. And now it's second and 10. And then all of a sudden it's a run play and that gets stopped. And now it's third and 10 or third and 11 or third and 12. Well, there's no rhythm to that. And you're not going to sustain that for any amount of time. And, and that brings up the, this whole notion of we knew Washington was going to score. The weakest part of Texas's team, really, and in, in particular their defense, is their passing defense. And Washington was going to, as I said on this show, score in the mid to upper 30s. Okay, so there was going to be an urgency for Texas to go out there and score a lot of points. Well, you're not going to score a lot of points when your first six third downs are all third and ten or longer. That's just too difficult. You can't sustain offense that way. You're not going to score with any efficiency that way. You're not going to score 40 points when you're constantly behind the chains. Then you combine that lack of efficiency with those two turnovers, and one of them points for Washington right away. The other, you feel like you're going to get points, and there's a fumble, and you're not going to overcome that. And I know that they made it a close game, um, and, and good for them, and Texas had an incredible year. But this Washington team, they they force you into that mode where you've got to play with a lot of urgency because you know they're going to score a lot of points. And that would be you know a point I would make about any great team is that great teams force you to feel an uncomfortable amount of urgency. Michigan forces that on you, and I think Washington forces that on you. There's this urgency when you play Washington and you're just like, man, we're going to have to score on most of our possessions. That's tough to do puts you under a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. Michigan, on the other hand, you get this sense like they create an urgency because they, there's this threat that they're going to squeeze the life out of you. And so it's like, well, every opportunity we get, we have to take advantage of it because we don't know how many we're going to get. See, great teams force you into an uncomfortable amount of urgency. And that urgency creates stress. And then that stress creates missed assignments and lack of execution. That's why great teams generally win. That's why great teams generally win. And these two teams are great teams. Michael Penix, back, uh, I want to continue this thought on Michael Penix just quickly. Michael Penix is absolutely um, a guy that I would consider in the top five of the NFL draft. Top 10, certainly. His medical might be an issue because of those injuries that he's had previously uh, to his knees. And we'll see how that comes back. But he does everything well. His game translates incredibly well to the next level. Look at the throws he makes. He's like a stronger, more powerful version as far as a passer goes of, of Tua. Now, is, is he as good as, as Tua? I'm not sure. Maybe. With maybe he's got that potential because he certainly has more power in his delivery as a passer, um, and his accuracy and his ability to have downfield accuracy and downfield timing. Again, there's a bottom line proposition in quarterback play, and I use this a lot in draft prep: is the ball on target and on time. And with Michael Penix, it is on target and on time, and this is what allows him to be as good of a downfield passer as we've seen in college football in a long time. And so we've got this matchup. We've got Michigan and we've got Washington. And I guess we could have just not had a playoff and just had a good old fashioned Rose bowl pack, pack 12, big 10 for the national championship game. Um, some new blood in this game. We're going to get a coach that has never won a national championship. That's going to win a national championship. Uh, we're going to get a conference that's going to win a national championship that hasn't won a national championship for a long time. Big 10 going back to 2014 and, and the Pac-12 all the way back, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, to USC. So like this, this in a lot of ways is uh, historic, this matchup between Washington and Michigan. And we'll get it next Monday night live from Houston. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll be back with a breakdown of the matchup later in the week. That'll be right here on the Joel Class Show. Make sure to, if you're watching, subscribe on YouTube, uh, comment below. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. 
and uh, we'll get to those comments. Maybe we will make adjustments. If you want to follow us on social media, at Joel Klatt Show there. We'll be back with more national championship game preview later in the week.